most people don't pay attention to, and we're going to show you how to, is looking at what's really essential in our life. On, in our last discussion, we talked about how what you focus on is what you're going to end up getting, and how when you focus on what's really important to you, then important things can happen. Focus on the negative, negative's going to happen. Well, now we're going to focus on the essentials, what you really need to get everything else in perspective. Because do you ever notice sometimes when you really have a lot of decisions to make, you begin to clutter your lives with things that are not essential? Little things, little time things, phone calls, anything and everything to distract you from really what's essential. And the essential is kind of standing off there by itself. You know, you kind of move around it psychically and emotionally. You're kind of looking at it and figuring it out. Michelangelo made a comment to the effect that in every piece of stone there is a beautiful piece of art. And of course, if you look at what he did with stone, you would agree with him. Now the question is, is there a piece of art in everything? Is there a piece of art in every person? Or do we allow it simply to be what a limited vision would have without development? Well, of course, he had the mastery, the skill, and the development to allow that to occur. A piano has no music until we make it. And that's one of the nice things, even a voice. A voice can resonate screechy and high and all different modulations. It's what you choose to do with your voice. And any voice can be trained to sound in any way we want. Have you ever noticed that when you want to be soft and, and very mellow, you can with your voice? Did you ever notice how you're around a baby, you know, a little kid, versus the same person in the same voice box when you're angry? Or you want to be emphatic, or you want to get someone's undivided attention and how you talk to them? Same person, same thing, but it's used in a different range. So what I want to do is get rid of the clutter separate the things that are not essential to our development and well-being, and let's, let's get with what's essential. Now, I'm going to ask a series of questions, and I'd like some feedback from you on these questions. We live in a society that is made up of thousands upon thousands of institutions to which dozens or hundreds we individually involve ourselves. No one belongs to just one institution because you have educational institutions, economic institutions, uh, work, uh, religious. They're all integrated on different planes. But that means we also have to take on much of the beliefs of anything that we then become a part of because we're gaining something from it and it's also providing an image for us. It's providing part of our reason for being. We're taking our cues, we're taking our values from it. Now, what you take your values from, you must automatically defend. So then we don't see things always as it really is, but rather as how we've been told it should be for our own perpetuation. Doesn't mean that it's true. But something fundamental happens, something changes in our lives forever when we seek truth above superficial facade and reality. Now, being honest does what? What happens when we begin honesty? Huh? You feel good. Why do you feel good? Because your true self. Your true self, all right? So you're expressing true self, so you feel good. What else happens when we're being honest? You feel free. You're free because you're free from what? Well, from having to, having to lie or having to be something you're not. Do you, do you have any idea how much time and attention we have to put into dece deceiving someone and then trying to always remember what we did in our deception yeah. so that they never figure it out? And of course, then we always have to hold that as a part of ourself. That, that's a door to our soul that remains locked. The lie locks the door to the soul. I think we've forgotten the importance of how that mindset, institutional mindset, has prevailed to this day in all institutions, and the fear that many have if they relied upon a woman because the still fear of the mystique of the female feeling and being. Men come from, I'll educate you and teach you. Women come from, I'll nurture you and, and emotionally bond with you. There's two different things. Now, both could be in either one and are in many cases, but we've artificially separated them. And a lot of this artificial separation is what keeps people confused about the opposite sex. 
So you can imagine what happens when someone starts blaming someone else for what they feel. Then the circumstances and hence the people become their victim. We have the same thing today. We had it with blacks for so long, didn't we? We had it with Jews for so long, right? The Jews were persecuted, still are, right? We haven't gotten past these fundamentals. Isn't it amazing, land someone on the moon and we can't get past racism? Where have we gone in our evolution? Haven't made any great quantum steps. So what I do is when I look at people who are free to be honest, they should be free to be honest in an environment where they're not hurt for their honesty. So when a person doesn't have to deceive and they don't have to make things up and then just say what they feel, but hopefully say it with a sense of respect for the people they're saying it to so they don't use their freedom as a weapon against other people, sensitively say it, then they don't have to feel guilty. Well, my God, guilt is directly based upon the inner deceptions that we permeate. Knowing that you have feelings, desires, thoughts that you're not sharing creates guilt at the subconscious level. The fear to go forward with what you believe to be right, like you feeling, we talked be, uh, before we started about when you see doctors giving AZT and you think that they're a murderer, and I suggest they're not murderers. They're just people who believe very much, completely dedicated in what they believe. Do you for a second think that the majority of the people who had held to the vows of celibacy didn't believe in celibacy? They believed in it. The politic believed in it, of their being. But their body, the body can't. I mean, no matter who you are, you're gonna have physiological sensations. Now, if you make yourself feel guilty because you have these, then you've got to assuage your guilt. Then you become even more obedient, more fervent, more radical to your beliefs. You begin to self-admonish. You begin an emotional flagellation of self. I'm not worthy because I don't have the strength to keep from having a sexual arousal. Well, it's biological. We were created to procreate. If we didn't, we wouldn't have a species. That's like saying to a woman, how dare you menstruate? Yeah, but I may not want to, but, but it happens. It's a part of, bio well, it shouldn't be. It's evil. And we cover these things in ways that we shouldn't. Well, what if we had an ability just to be honest about everything? Just honest. And we weren't going to allow other people to hurt us because when you're completely vulnerable and you're completely honest and they're synonymous, Nobody can hurt you. You cannot be hurt when being completely honest. What can happen is other people can reject you. There's a downside to it. You can lose things. You, you're gonna make a lot of sacrifices by being honest in the society we live in because so few people also engage in honest receptivity. Being honest in projection doesn't mean someone's gonna be honest in accepting what we're projecting. What are some of the other benefits of being honest? Yes, universal truths. Remember, a truth has no validity if it's only your truth. And one of the things about being honest is ask, is this a universal honesty or is it a partial honesty? You can, have a, you can be truthful about something, but it's, only, it, it's, a, it's not a secular truth. Like the person who says, I must not trust you because you are another nationality. Maybe that's what they believe. They've been conditioned, they've been indoctrinated. So consciously they must believe that. The inner conscious knows that that's a lie. So there's always this burr, inner feeling that something's wrong with what I believe, but we don't know what. So they believe in something, so they're being honest with their beliefs, but it's not a universal honesty. So we have to match our individual honesty with universal honesty. And that's frequently where we make a big step outside of our belief system. What are some of the other benefits? I'm just wondering, how do you know what is universally true, though? I mean, who are that, we to say what is true? That which honors life is true. No one has the right to take another life. No one has the right to dishonor another life. So as long as everything you do honors, if I'm growing something organically and I'm not adulterating the soil, 
the air, the water, or a body, that's a, a universal truth. But if I'm in India and I've been given pesticides and the only knowledge I have is to grow one crop and the only way I can grow it is with pesticides or it'll be eaten by insects, then my individual truth is I can't grow anything but corn here or wheat or rice and I have to use these pesticides and that's my truth. That's correct, but it's not a universal truth. So we have to look at the consequences of what we believe in. Extend from you your belief in how it will manifest and affect other people. And when you see it in its circular motion, then you see, is it a universal truth? What are some other benefits of truth? Yes. The first step toward genuine communication with another person. Good point. Beautiful point. How in the world are we going to communicate with meaning if we're always communicating with partial deception? At least when I'm honest, people can say to me, Gary, I appreciate you being honest, but I don't like what you're saying and I can't accept it. And that happens all the time, by the way, which is okay. At least they know where I stand, right? And they have a right to reject it. I have no right to expect anyone to accept me or what I say. I have to accept me and what I say. And my truth is establishing the anchor of my position. I'm willing to be responsible for what I say because what I say is what I am. And it's what I have created. That's my creation. I'm uniquely and individually responsible for it. Now, you can say, good, if I like it. No, I don't. But I'm not going to not do it because you're going to reject me. If I had to stop and think every time I said something, whether or not you would accept or reject it and then edit it, then you wouldn't be here tonight, would you? No, you wouldn't. Because I'd be telling you nothing new, nothing vital, because I'd be more careful not to trip any emotional wires, not to make you feel uncomfortable. I know by the questions I'm asking that with every question, some people in this room will become uncomfortable. Now, did I create the discomfort? Huh? Did the question create the discomfort? What created the discomfort? They had an emotional minefield waiting for someone to step on it with what they said. But they will automatically blame. I don't like that Gary and all. God, he, you know, he's a megalomaniac asshole. I'm staying away from him. <laughs> yeah. He should eat a vitamin E and drop dead. <laughs> oh, it's amazing what happens when you say the magic word. Oh, yeah. People respond. You can see their body. You can see the emotions their body's going through. But at least if I'm honest, and if I'm not saying something to hurt people, but rather saying it because what I feel is what I am committing myself to, and I've taken the time to think it through and think the consequences through, then I've committed myself to honesty. And what's nice about committing yourself to honesty is you can never go back to deception. You just can't. It's like being in a straitjacket and getting out. You'd never want to be restricted and limited in how you can express yourself. So when I go to sleep at night, when I, my head hits the pillow, I'm asleep. I have no worries on my mind that I have left unsolved or unresolved. Truth suddenly assuages everything. Because the worst that can happen, what's the worst that can happen if you're honest? People get mad at you. They get mad at you. What? <laughs> they fire you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, how... Yeah, but the idea is, would you want to work for a place that only wanted you there because you were a liar? No, thank you. All right, you see? A doctor called me today and said, Gary, I'm really in a crisis. I can't come to the meeting tonight. I said, why not? He said, well, because I had three nurses quit on me today. I said, good for you. He says, good for me. I said, good for you. He says, no, it's not good, Gary. I've been up all night. I said, well, then you got a couple lessons to learn here. Let's, what are the lessons? One. You've allowed someone else to become more essential in your practice than you. Do you know how to make a stick? Of course I know. I've made thousands. Then make a stick. That's all that they have to do, and that's all you're paying them to do. Secondly, you've spent too much time in, the, in your office on the phone instead of with the patient. Thirdly, when you show the people in your office that you can do it all, and therefore when they're helping you, they are assisting you, they're facilitating then they can't hold you in a position of a form of emotional, uh, emotional ransom. 
So go through the pain of being the person there today by yourself and see that at the end of the day you're stronger because of what you went through. When you hit a problem head on and you're not afraid of the consequences, then you'll resolve the problem. It's when we think the problem is bigger than what it is and we fear the problem for being a problem, then we don't look for solutions. We look for ways around the fear. To assuage the fear is not to assuage the problem. The problem doesn't go away because you get rid of the fear. You've merely taken your fear of a problem and you've put it off into someplace else. So when I believe that you got fear, you go right into the fear. Embrace the fear, completely absorb the fear, and you'll see that it was an illusion. Tonight before I came here, I stopped off at this particular doctor's office and I said, well, how'd it go? He says, you were right. I had no problems today. He said, I did 10, uh, 10 patients with no problems. I said, well, then what were you paying three nurses to do that work for? He said, you're right, I was lazy. I was spending too much time in my office instead of working with a patient. Now I've got more rapport with a patient, and I'm doing the basics of what I was taught to do. He said, so my initial pain that I, you know what he was going to do? He was going to call an emergency nurse's service. They charge $65 an hour to come in. He said, had a whole bunch of backup nurses. He'd have been a nervous wreck all day. Instead, he did it himself. Back to the basics. That's what we got to remember in life. We have far more capability. But at least now he's facing a problem honestly instead of hiding it. Next issue. Which is more important, the choice you make or the circumstance that you make it from? Think of that question. It's an important question. Do you understand the question? Okay. Which is more important, the choice, right? We're clear on that. The choice that you make or the circumstance that you make your choice from? Circumstance, choice. Circumstance, choice. Circumstance. Circumstance, choice. Choice. choice, choice. All right, let's look at both, okay? <clears throat> let's say that you have a situation here. You have, you have a problem, all right? You have a circumstance out here. Let's say that you're in a relationship. Now, this is not an uncommon one, where you don't know what the communication is, right? They talk, but you never seem to feel that you really understand what they're, they're really meaning. No matter how many words they use, it's never really, you're not resonating that something's really been honest here. So you've got a problem, the problem of communication. Is that a common one? Yeah. Most, right? Most people have that, right? <laughs> Everyone's got that. Now, you've got a choice. The choice is... And here's where choice and circumstance are crucial. My choice might be, I will ask you to tell me the message behind your message. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Most people, because of fear in being honest and the responsibility they have to commit themselves to their honesty, always tell you something other than what it is, but it's somehow connected. They expect you to make the connection. But you don't know all the different ways that it's supposed to be connected. You don't, you don't have the blueprints. You don't know that it's connected. All right? Example. Charlie, uh, want to go out, uh, you know, catch a movie tomorrow? Gary, I'm not sure. Um, I, why don't we do this? Uh, can you uh, let me call you back later? Charlie, okay. Bad communication. I've given Charlie two messages. What's the first message? Might be okay, but might means what? You got something better, Charlie. You're not important. So I've given him two messages, haven't I? But I haven't been honest with him, right? I've led him to believe that it's just a matter of me adjusting my schedule for him to see whether or not I could be with him. So Charlie now feels a little uneasy. Charlie has a choice. Charlie could say, Gary, yes or no. Either yes, you want to go with me, or no, you don't. What is it? You got two choices, Gary. You don't have a third. Maybe isn't a choice. All right? That, him selecting a choice, frees him from that moment on 
to require honesty and communication, no more double messages, no more messages within messages, no more riddles and enigmas within puzzles. Straight to the point in my communication. That choice changes your entire way of dealing with the circumstance. I'm merely a circumstance. Therefore, never allow me, a circumstance, to become more significant than the choice you're willing to make. Therefore, the choice is always more important than the circumstance. In our society, we always make the circumstance more important. And why? Why do we make circumstance more important? Fear? Gee, if I press the issue, he won't be my friend. He may tell me what I don't want to hear. He may be the only friend I can have. We somehow think there's a shortage of good people, good jobs. How many times at work have you been asked to do something you really didn't want to do, but you did it? Or you were told to do something and rather asked, and yet you feared communicating what you really felt because you felt the choice of what you could make would change the circumstance that you were in. Suddenly people look at you, oh, well, you're Mrs. Hypersensitive? Oh, well, then we'll find someone else to do the work. And suddenly all these messages upon messages. So you end up with countless messages about what happens if you can't control your circumstance. That's why the circumstance shouldn't be what we focus on. Our choice should, because you know what a choice does? It frees you. Frees you. If you know how to use choices, you won't wait around for everyone else to catch up with you. Not or choices, or you bet. What you take, your I am, That's right. I am me and I am and your me. choice commits you to being responsible for what you feel. Completely connected to honesty. That's correct. It's a part of honesty and it's part of vulnerability. But if you make the circumstance more important, then suddenly you've limited yourself in choices to the circumstances response. So your choice no longer is essential as the response from the choice or the choice uh, response from the circumstance. So now what the circumstance thinks, what they're going to say, what they're going to do becomes more important and essential than your choice. That's why value your choices. You free yourself by choices. Make the right choice. And the right choice is the honest choice. Maybe not in the short term. I will acknowledge absolutely I have lost more things in my life, more deals, relationships. I've had more people come in and out of my life than you could ever imagine because I wasn't willing to compromise on certain principles of ethics and, and how I want to relate with people. But my belief is I don't have a quota, right? Gee, Gary, you've, you've You've seen four people this month, that's, that's your quota. Why? If I want to see 4,000 people. I've interviewed over 85 people for a producer's job. I haven't hired one yet. All right? If I have to interview 4,000 people, I will until I find the right one. How often in life we forget about what's right for us is more than the convenience of changing the impatience, certainty of our circumstance. Think of how many times you have money and you didn't want to save the money, you want to spend it. All right? Got some money now. Let's buy something. <coughs> or a house. Well, the only place we've got is between Avenue A and Avenue B, you know, on the Lower East Side. I mean, there's no other place in Manhattan right now at that affordable rent. Better take it. Got it. And we all get this idea of, you know, it's not going to be around tomorrow, Jack. Get it now, tonight, the house in Queens. Last time, gone. So everything becomes, gee, I better rush in and take advantage of those circumstances instead of making the right choice. Never let a circumstance be more important than your choices. <clears throat> what is something? Something is a noun. What is it? What is something? I got, no, I got, I got a multiple choice. Is something what we see, huh? 
When we vote for a president, what do we vote for? <laughs> right? Twiddly D and Twiddly Do, right? <laughs> Who looks nicest, right? The image. The Im no, the message doesn't get you elected. No. The image gets you elected. We, well, all right, what you, what you, what you, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. Good point. You would not elect someone based upon image without substance. Every president since FDR has been elected based upon image rather than substance. All right, with the possible exception of Truman. But everybody else, and clearly Clinton won based upon image. Hey, baby boomers, we got our, you know, casual khakis on throwing the football, let's do a little basketball, and suddenly every 45-year-old going, yeah, that's my man for president. He's out there, you know, in his, you know, Calvin Klein's. I can see him. I can, I can see him with the rim glasses. I can see him. He's cool, right? And if he's cool, I got to trust him because he's like me, reflection. We don't see some little grumpy guy, right, who's terribly honest and very, in, very sincere, and, but very, very much without the answer, saying, I'm very vulnerable. I don't know quite what to do. Well, does anyone know what to do? Would it matter if we didn't have a Washington, D.C.? Be honest. No, it really wouldn't. Do we need a CIA? No. Did you hear my show today on the CIA? Yeah. Now, be honest. How many of you here are CIA hip people? <laughs> all right, see, seven. That's all right. Only takes one. <laughs> Take the bullet. Here. There they are. <laughs> when you really know what the CIA does, you realize it's, it's stupid, isn't it? It's like a game. We don't need them. We don't need 47 intelligence agencies, right? Who are they getting intelligence on? Me, you, FBI wants to hear all of our phone calls. It's not because we're terrorists, and it's not because we have a nation of running around blowing up everything, right? One building gets blown up by a group yet to be determined, and we got 260 million Americans who are not blowing up anything. So why tap 260 million Americans' phones? Unless you want to know what they're talking about, well, when we see something, if we say what we see is what it is, then gee whiz, that's a whole reality, isn't it? What, how's that going to change things if what we see is what it is? But what if something is what we expect it to be? Well, that's a different reality. You see, if what something is is what you expect it to be, then what if it doesn't know what your expectations are? And what if every person has a different expectation? Could you imagine being a politician today? Who are you? You are who your constituency expects you to be, but you have such a diversity of ex uh, constituents and special interest groups. I can't imagine how many masks they must have to try on before they go to Washington. It's a very confusing issue, right? They can't be just one thing because one thing's not going to serve all interests. It's highly divisive. What is something? What we think it is? Well, what if we don't think right on it? Think how many people would like to believe that our Defense Department is going off there to make the best in Bosnia to protect, to protect a national security. Huh. What national security? <laughs> Gee, some Bosnians are essential to our national No, it has nothing to do with anything. But they're playing it because in coming up in election year, Clinton can make a lot of leeway if he takes the credit for world peace, right? But it's not going to be world peace. They've been in conflict for 600 years. They will be in conflict. It'll be a quagmire. We'll be getting a lot of bodies back in body bags. They will have flags, little marches. The president will send letters. You died a hero. No, these people didn't die heroes. They died fools because they didn't look at what they were being a part of and used. And that's the danger when you see something in the wrong perspective.